resurrection video. Good morning, my name's Tim. Uh, welcome to our Resurrection Day service. It has been Resurrection Day all over the world for many hours. Uh, we've received reports that our two Bangkok churches had record crowds there this morning. And I thought you might get a kick out of this picture as uh, our church plant in Nitra, Slovakia has taken in all these refugees of kids. Can we transition to that picture? There we go. They had an Easter egg hunt after their worship service this morning. Those are all U Ukrainian refugee kids who have showed up at our uh, Nitra Slovakia church with um, Andre and Susie, and they had quite a morning this morning celebrating the resurrection of Jesus, as I hope you're having as well. Somebody said to me this morning, looks like you're uh, getting ready to do a wedding, uh, I guess because of the suit, and I am. I am, and I got good news for you. The groom is alive. Yep. We are here for a wedding. Every day in the Christian faith is a wedding because we have a magnificent spouse. His name is Jesus. Welcome to our glorious Resurrection Day service. Jesus died to forgive sin, yes? But he rose to rule over the curse. And Jesus right now is reigning and ruling with the Father alive. Our context this morning, though, is that we are finishing this incredible book of Revelation. It's been a nine-month journey, and so we'll, well, here's what we're going to try to do this morning. We're going to try to show the importance of the first resurrection, making Jesus the centerpiece of everything about our lives as we wait for the second one. We're, so we're, what we're studying today is uh, full of hope. I hope, pray that you are full of of hope this morning. Here's what's happened so far. Let me run through the whole book of Revelation for you. It'll take a couple of days. Here we go. We have seen that all end times from the first resurrection to the second are end times, okay? And they are full of suffering like the recipients of the letter originally were received, okay? That suffering is just what they were going through. In these end times, all folks living in Christ have had to figure out their Faith, all through the end times, all through the 2,000 years, through every antichrist, through every symbolic beast of that day and this day, they've all come to challenge that faith. But Jesus has shown himself superior. Jesus is showing himself superior over and over and over again to all the negatives of the curse. That's what he showed at the resurrection. That's why you're here. That's why we're celebrating. He is victorious over sin. He's over, victorious over death just as he was at the first resurrection today, and he will be at the end of time. And then lastly, Jesus is coming back to restore all things, yes? He's coming back with another resurrection. He's coming back with our resurrection. And all the negative effects of the curse will be thrown into the lake of fire, along with those who refuse his love. Which brings us to our direct context today of the new heavens and the new earth. As John is being shown the new heavens and the new earth, and they contain the river of life, the presence of Jesus, the living water. He's alive. He's in this room as we speak today by the Spirit of God. Jesus finishes here this morning by addressing John to write these things down. See, if nobody wrote these things down, you wouldn't have any hope. <laughs> We know what happened. We know what is happening. We know what will happen because these writers wrote down that which God told them to write down. And now he talks directly to his people. He talks, if you're one of his believers in this room today, and I invite you, if you're not one, to become one before the day is over, he directly invites all of his people of all days and ages leading up to the second coming to have hope. Because Jesus knows our struggle. I hope over the last 36 hours you've had an opportunity to recognize that Jesus struggled. He laid in a tomb dead, but he's not there anymore. Last week we finished with this, an angel speaking for Jesus, verse 9 of chapter 22. And he said to me, these words are trustworthy and true. You're making a decision right now inside your heart, soul, and minds if that's true. These words are trustworthy and true. By the way, that's how we know how Jesus lives today. Because the words of the book are true. And the Lord, 
The God of the spirits of the prophets has sent his angels to show his servants what must soon take place. And behold, the angel says for Jesus, I'm coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of of the prophecy of this book. Would you like to be blessed today? I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed them to me. But he said to me, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers, the prophets, and with those who keep the words of this book. And then his simple retort to all of us who have a tendency to worship created things. Yes, an angel is a created thing, and he gets rebuked here and gets corrected here with two words. Worship God. See, John was always trying to worship this angel throughout the book. I'm glad I never tried to worship created things. How about you? Huh? Whew. Our goal here is that, as, as we leave here today is that you will have experienced the risen Christ. Plain and simple. That's, that's it. I hope you enjoyed the kids. I hope you're enjoying the music. I hope you enjoy everything that happens here today. I hope you're full of hope. But you, that will not happen unless we experience the risen Christ and that you experience him to such a degree that you feel the blessing of believing the words of the prophecy of this book. What is involved with keeping the words of the prophecy? Well, Jesus just showed you. We worship God. Plain and simple, we worship God. We don't fall on our face before an angel. We don't fall on our face before anything else that is created, but only the risen Christ alone. Today's passage, verse 10. And he said to me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. Let the evildoers still do evil, and the filthy still be filthy, and the righteous still do right, and the holy still be holy. The whole purpose of this book, Revelation and the whole Bible, is that Jesus would be fully known. I don't know what you use your Bible for, but that's the purpose of the book, is that Jesus Christ would be fully known. And so the angel says to us here, don't seal that up. And I hope right now you have a little check in your soul whether you have sealed up the book. Does anybody know that you believe the book? Does anybody know that your life is based on the book? Because the life's not actually based on the book, it's based on the subject of the book, and his name is Jesus. People need the risen Christ. Do you, not, do you think our culture's in good shape? People need the risen Christ. Don't seal that up. The stone is off the tomb. Yes, that was a sealer. It's off the tomb. People need the risen Christ. Let him be known. But the recipient of this letter, you and me, right? You and me, we're the recipients of this letter. It went to the first century church for their comfort, for their joy, for their hope. But it's to you and me. We need this book. And so the cryptic words of those verses that we just read about Evil and righteousness need to be understood. See, this is a stark reminder of human responsibility. As sovereign as God is, humans are responsible. In the midst of a sovereign, forgiving God, we are responsible for our thoughts, words, and actions. So this prophecy that we just read kind of goes out like, kind of like Jesus' words to Judas as he sent him out to betray. Jesus told him, he said, Well, go do what you must. Jesus said, go do what you must to his betrayer. And it's the same here. He says, if your heart is evil, do what you must. And if your heart has, but if your heart has been won by the power of God, if your heart has been won by the risen Christ, if your heart has been won by the spirit that raised Jesus from the dead that we celebrate today, then good. Good. Go roll that. Go roll that. Is anybody in here? Okay, just making sure. I thought maybe everybody went to sleep. Verse 12. Behold. Jesus kind of takes over the conversation. Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay each, each for what he has done. Let me just say this. Be aware. Repent, be ready, because judgment is coming. Verse 13, Jesus said, I'm the Alpha and the Omega. You can try to do something with something else, but I'm the 
A, the beginning, and omega, the end, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Jesus just keeps reminding us that the whole story is about him. It's everything that we are about here at City on a Hill. You see, it was Alpha, Jesus, the beginning that spoke and all creation formed out of chaos, yes? It was Alpha, Jesus, who was disobeyed in full rebellion in the garden by his crowning creation, us. His image bearers decided that we wanted to self-rule and brought sin and sickness and death. It was this Alpha and Omega Jesus that all promise of the Old Testament was about. It was this Alpha and Omega Jesus who was crucified, dead to forgive our sin, and buried, and on the third day rose from the dead to secure our redemption. It was this Alpha and Omega Jesus who married his church, his bride, to bring glory even in these chaotic days of the now and not yet. Therefore, this tie, we ought to do some vows here this morning, right? (laughs) If we're we're doing a marriage feed, we ought to just do some, we ought to do some vows this morning. Uh, uh, Will you take this man? Will you take this man? I'm going to ask you, if you're going to come feast at the wedding wedding table, I'm going to say, will you take this man to be your lawfully wedded husband, yes? We've got an incredible risen groom this morning. He married his church to bring glory in these chaotic days of the thou and not yet. And it will be Jesus who completes the omega, the end, by crashing through the clouds and bringing with him the end to all effects of the curse and bringing with him the final uh, resurrection and the restoration of all things and bringing with him the new heavens and the new earth, and all will be perfect. Why? Because he is perfect. Yes? You know, people say around town, man, you all talk about Jesus a lot. He's the whole story. He's the Genesis, the Alpha. He's the revelation. He's the end. Yes. We are washing our robes in the river of life. Let's see that. Verse 14. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they might have the right to the tree of life and that they may enter the city by the gates. Anybody interested in going through those gates? Outside are the dogs and the sorcerers and the sexually immoral and murderers. And just in case you don't think you're any of those nasty things, the idolaters. He gets all of us. And everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I don't know about you, but I've lied a lot. You see, judgment is complete at this point. Judgment is complete at this point and look into the future. And those who have refused the forgiveness of Christ at the cross, it says, are outside. So we have a simple, a simple exhortation to you today. Yes, we have a simple exhortation for you today. Don't be a dog. Those of you that have dog lovers, it's not a shot at you. Just read the scripture, just so you know. How do you avoid being a dog? Run from the idols of our culture. Understand what the idols of our culture are. It used to be sex, drugs, and rock and roll, right? But it is anything, gifts from God, that we place above God. Anything that is good that we make ultimate above God. Those are our idols, just in case you don't think you're an idolater. I am one. Anybody else in this room? I am a redeemed idolater, forgiven by the blood of Jesus, and trying to be empowered by the power of the resurrection not to be one. I want to be an undog. Can you say that? (laughs) Cleansed by by his blood, empowered by his resurrection. See, we're blessed as we join their ranks. Verse 16. The Savior himself says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. This is no small deal that you get a message straight from the king of glory, yes? This is no small thing that he thought enough of you that on this Easter in 2022, after after years of insanity that we're, we're living through, in the midst of insanity, he thought enough of you to write these things down. 
and to give you hope today. Because he says, I am the root and the descendant of David. I'm the one, the bright and morning star. He says, I, Jesus, just to be clear, this is Jesus, the risen king of glory, am the one informing you this morning. It's not Tim Gray. By the power of his spirit, it is Jesus Christ himself that's informing you that he is the subject of all human history. All of it. The Alpha and the Omega from beginning to end. Verse 17, the spirit and the bride, (laughs) oh man, capital letters, the spirit and the bride say, come. This is an invitation. The spirit and the bride say, come. God's been calling you for a while. God has you here this morning to call you. It's an invitation. This sounds like the whole Old Testament when, when the people were right, come, come to the waters and let the one who hears Say, come, and let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires take the water of life without price. By the way, there was a price. That blood was precious that hit the ground that we talked about on Friday. But it's been paid. It's been paid completely. And let me just say this. We have people in this room and people online who are currently outside the city. It's not too late. The invitation is to come. The invitation is, and I know you're thirsty. (laughs) There's nobody who's not drinking living water who's not thirsty. There's no such thing. It's free. It's free. Come. Come and partake of the water. In a moment, we're going to have communion. The invitation from Jesus. To anybody in this room, you don't have to be a member of this church. We We don't have rules like that. Jesus said, if you believe in me, come to my table. And so in a a moment here, there's an invitation to come and have a meal. Come to the table. You're welcome if you believe. I mean, it's like a wedding feast, right? We're taking vows here this morning. We're having a wedding. And so I invite you to the wedding feast here in just a moment. But verse 18 and 19 come first. He says, I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy. And by the way, I saw some TV preachers this morning that need to really worry about this. I'm scared as I stand up here. I warn everyone who hears the words of this prophecy of the book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues. I've read Exodus, it's not pretty, described in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the prophecy of this book, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this book. Let me just say this to you. Be really careful about who you let teach you. Be really careful. And by the way, this whole thing's a little scary for anyone who teaches this thing. That's why I put a tie on, just so I felt a little more comfortable today. (laughs) Shaking a little bit in my nice suit right now. But there are a bunch of false prophets who wear expensive suits. They even put the pants on. (laughs) So I pray this. I pray this, that whoever you're allowing to speak into your soul, including you, you understand that you're your most common preacher, right? Right? You're your most common prophet. You're your most common discipler. I pray that even as you're preaching to yourself, that you've been thoroughly submitted to the Spirit so that it's the Spirit who is going to do nothing but proclaim Jesus is your main counselor who constantly proclaims Jesus. Here's the Spirit testifying. Verse 20. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Say that with me. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Come on, one more time. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Man, I was kind of just hoping that maybe he would just get stirred by that. Come on. And now the there's seven benedictions. We've gone through the first six. Here's the seventh and last benediction of the book of Revelation as we pray for the Lord Jesus to come. Come, Lord Jesus, and remove the curse. Come and live among us. Come and live with us. As usual, we don't get pulled out of here and go to him, but the risen Christ is gracious and comes to us, and he says this in his final benediction. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with us all. Amen. On this Easter, we have the opportunity to join this angel. Come, Lord Jesus.
Good news. Here's, what, here's what's going on right now. Is he's already here. He beat you here by a long spot. We don't need to tell him to come anywhere. He's sovereign. He's everywhere. <laughs> but he wants to eat with you. He wants to eat with you today. And we pray also that he arrive physically. Because that's when it gets really good. But I want to finish this morning to make sure we understand who we are inviting. And I want to invite Jesus' words himself to make sure we understand the identification of who we're inviting. Here's what he said. Here's what Jesus said. He said this, I am the great I am. Yes? yes. Sovereign God himself, Lord of all. Do you believe him? Yes. He said, I am the bread of life, sustainer. Do you believe him? Yes. He said, I am the true vine, abiding, blessing. Do you believe him? Yes. I am the light of the world. Light presses out darkness. Do you believe him? Yes. I am the gate, the doorway to the city. Do you believe him? Yes. I am the good shepherd. Leads us to health. Do you believe him? Yes. He said this, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. Do you believe him? Yes. And today, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. <laughs> Jesus has defeated death. Do you believe him? If you believe him, please come to the table. Please, right now, just get up. Get up while you're excited about Jesus and come to the table. God bless you.